Good morning, and welcome to worship on this second Sunday in Advent. My name is Seth Novak, and I'm the pastor of Onyx Day Lutheran Church. On behalf of the entire community, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a, a bulletin with an order of service from the link in the video description below. Now today, in addition to being the second Sunday in Advent, is also the commemoration for a very well-known and popular saint. December 6th is the feast day for Saint Nicholas, who is perhaps best known for his flying reindeer and his workshop full of elves. But before our friend Nicholas moved to the North Pole, he was the Bishop of Myra in what's now Turkey uh, in the fourth century. He was one of the original signers of the Nicene Creed. And at that Council of Nicaea, he allegedly gave the heretical Bishop Arius a punch in the face. Now, little is known about Nicholas' actual life, but as with his northern doppelganger, many legends abound. One of the most popular is that he one time saved three daughters of a poor man from prostitution by sneaking uh, gifts, bags of gold into their house in the middle of the night to pay for their dowries. Now, in some versions of the story, he puts these three bags of gold in through the window, but in others, he drops them through the chimney. That maybe sounds a little more familiar. For this reason, he is considered the patron saint of virgins. He's also the patron of sailors, travelers, and merchants, the guardian of poor maidens, a protector against thieves and violence, and the patron saint of Russia and Greece. He died on this day in the year 342 in Myra. Today we remember and celebrate the stories of Nicholas' generosity and compassion as models for our own lives of Christian godliness and holiness. Finally, before we begin our worship today, we'd like to share some prayer concerns from the community. If you have your own prayer concerns, I'd invite you to add them in the chat right now. We also pray this day for Maggie uh, at the death of her husband, Dell, and for her cancer diagnosis. We pray also for Dick and Gail's daughter, Amy, who's recovering from her ordeal last week. At this time, I'll invite you to turn to your bulletin as we begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened by God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
because of war, because of violence in our communities, because there is still so much unrest in Jerusalem, we light a candle of peace. Because hatred is still so strong, because so many swords have not yet been beaten into plowshares, we light a candle of peace. May the light from this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's peace is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God's peace is at hand. Okay, go ahead with the Advent Nativity. Today was a camel, huh, Nessa? <laughs> Oh, the camel's gonna go there. No. Camel's gonna be walking free. <laughs> Poor camel. <laughs> and who's already there? Mary and Joseph? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, strengthen us to serve you with purified lives, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. No. The lesson for today is from the third chapter of the second letter to Peter, verses 8 through 15a. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, Strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and with regard and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. 
and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1910, New York City slated 300 buildings over an 11 block stretch to be demolished to make way for the, seventh, for the construction of 7th Avenue and the subway line that runs beneath it. The Times reported that the construction would, quote, ruthlessly cut through the neighborhood, destroying many curious residences and businesses. The tenants and owners of those residences and businesses made a loud protest against the city's decision, but in the end, the city claimed the properties through eminent domain, and so the buildings were lost. One landowner in particular fought tooth and nail against the demolition. David Hess, who lived in Philadelphia, owned the Voorhis apartment building directly in the path of the proposed construction. He refused to have his property claimed and raised by the city, and so he tried every legal means at his disposal and exhausted everything trying to stop that demolition. But eminent domain cannot be stopped. By 1914, the Voorhis was gone. <clears throat> Some years later, after Hess's death, his heirs discovered that the city surveyor had made a mistake. A small portion of the old Voorhis property was left undeveloped, and as his heirs, they had a legal claim to it as part of his estate. When the city found out, they asked the Hess family to donate that small piece of land. After all, there was hardly anything to it. It was barely worth anything, just a, a triangle about two feet on a side. Frank Hess, David's executor, described it as scarcely large enough for the erection of a slot machine. But the family was still angry about the seizure of the Voorhis, and so they refused the city's request, and they even went to court to claim their property. In 1922, they marked the space with a small plaque which reads, The property of the Hess estate, which has never been dedicated for public purposes. The Hess Triangle, or the Spite Triangle, as it's sometimes called, stands to this day on the corner of 7th Avenue and Christopher Street as, if, as the Hess family's judgment against the city's overreach. Now, to New Yorkers, this is a story of a little guy standing up to an overbearing government. It's a cautionary tale about the gutting of an entire neighborhood, all in the service of shaving a few minutes off a trip downtown. But setting aside for a moment all the arguments about whether or not it was right for the city to take the property, I can't help but think about how this story is as much about the refusal of Hess and his heirs to accept the inevitable. They could have simply donated the property and been done with it. Instead, they chose to invest the time and the court fees, probably spending well over the $100 it was worth, and to leave that message on it as a lasting testament to their displeasure. When I hear this story, I don't hear a judgment against the city of New York. I hear a judgment against the Hess's pettiness and greed. Of course, I don't know the whole story and I can't really judge, but it's hard not to draw some conclusions when looking at this tiny self-authored testament to their spite. During the season of Advent, we intentionally take time to pause, to look ahead to what is coming. The second epistle of Peter calls us to watch and to prepare for the coming reign of God, a reign of justice and peace. But just as New York had to tear down some buildings to make way for 7th Avenue, there are also some things that will need to be demolished to make way for God's reign. The letter tells us, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. The letter reminds us that in spite of its apparent tardiness of its fulfillment, 
God has a claim of eminent domain over the entire earth. And eminent domain cannot be stopped. Just like David Hess, we know what's coming, regardless of whether we welcome the promise of God's reign or fear it. The question that these readings invite us to reflect upon is what it means for us to prepare the way of the Lord in our own lives. From what are you being called to repent? What is there within your heart or within our society that holds us back from, from embracing God's reign of justice and peace? What are those things that we hold on to both as individuals and as a people, a nation, a human race, that risk becoming spite triangles, standing forever in judgment against us. When we look at this world around us, we can all see many different ways that this world groans in anticipation for God's intervention. This pandemic has served only to highlight many of those problems. Issues of racism and poverty, the hatred and the distrust that exists between us and our neighbors, the privilege that we have so successfully used to insulate ourselves from the suffering of others. The pandemic has torn off our blinders and forced us to acknowledge not only that these things exist, but that they are actively harming us, all of us, that they contribute not only to the rate of infection, but to the slow destruction of our society and our world. When I hear texts like these, my first instinct as a preacher is to rally the troops, to call people from their quietude and their passivity and to get busy preparing the way of the Lord. These texts make me see all the ways that we resist and or ignore God's eminent domain. And I feel compelled to call us all to start burning down these sins of ours ahead of God's reign to hasten that coming day of God. And that's the sermon I started writing this week, a sermon of which John the Baptist would have been proud, a good old fashioned fire and brimstone called repentance. But on further reflection, I came to realize that that's not the sermon God was calling me to preach. It's a sermon born of my own frustration over the brokenness of the world and the things that I can't change. My anger, and my sorrow over those things sometimes blinds me to the true message of the gospel, as well as to the ministries that you all faithfully carry out every day. I become as stubborn and as hard-headed as Hess, and that prophetic rage becomes my own little spite triangle, standing in judgment not against the world and not against you, but against myself. I'm starting to think, that wanting to preach those kinds of sermons is more about me feeling like God is calling me to greater action than it is about you. And so for me, and I hope for you as well, these texts bring good news. And that news is that neither you, nor I, nor any one of us, nor all of us together can create God's reign on earth. Only God can do that. God has called each of us to play a part in that coming reign, to lead lives of holiness and godliness as we await its coming. But what that means is different for each of us. Isaiah and John the Baptist and the writer of 2 Peter, they were all called to offer words of guidance and incitement and comfort and because they did, we've all been blessed. But we are not all called to be Isaiah's or John's or Peter's. Each of us has been uniquely invited by God to love the world around us in our own way. And whenever and however we answer those calls, the world is blessed just as much as by the soaring poetry of Isaiah or the fiery apocalyptic of Peter or the proleptic ministry of John. This season of Advent calls us out of our complacency to watch for what is coming, 
to consider how we will respond to God's call and prepare for God's kingdom most faithfully. That doesn't necessarily mean doing more than we are, but it might. It doesn't necessarily mean a better person than I already am, but it might. What work we are called to do will be different for each of us, and it will change over time. Keeping watch means to keep looking for your answer to that question of how you will respond to God's call, even if you've already found it. As you can see, I too am still trying to figure out what God is calling me to. If it seems daunting to think about all the work that needs to be done to heal this world, that's because it is. Thankfully, Brother John is here today to remind us that one more powerful than us is coming, that that one will accomplish what we cannot. If it seems like that promise is a long way off, that it might never get here, my brother Peter reminds us that God is being patient with us, giving us the time that we need to get our affairs in order and prepare for that day to figure out how best to respond to God's invitation. After all, my beloveds, God is not slow in the way that we think about slowness. The reign of God is not yet here, but at the same time, it's already come. Wherever God's children lead lives of holiness and godliness, God reigns. Wherever love is stronger than hate or fear, God reigns. Wherever a cup of cool water is offered in Jesus' name, God reigns. In the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us in our baptism, we have already each been given everything that we need to do what God is calling us to do. Today we remember that the eminent domain of God cannot be stopped, that the lines have been drawn and all that stands in the way of God's promises has been slated for demolition. Nothing that we do or don't do can stop it. But knowing what is coming, what sort of persons will we be? What sort of persons is God calling us to be? How will you respond to God's invitation? Knowing what is coming, where can we watch for and look for the signs that it is already beginning to appear? With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. 
for the whole church, its ministry, and the mission of the gospel. For peace and justice in the world, the nations and those in authority, and our local community. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, lonely. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. for Anya's day and for the people closest to us. For the faithful departed. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all those for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Advent is a season of waiting and preparing for God. Right now, I'd like to invite you to prepare your gifts of bread and wine or juice to share in the Eucharist from your home. In this meal, God takes these humble gifts and uses them to nourish us body and soul. In the same way, God takes all of the humble gifts that we donate to this ministry and uses them to bless us so that we may bless the world. If you'd like to join me in supporting this ministry of God's blessing, you can find a link in the video description below to our webpage where you can give a one-time gift or set up a recurring donation. I thank you for your generosity and for your presence here today. and mysterious God, in the beginning the darkness waited, and you created light. Sarah and Abraham waited for a future, and you sent descendants greater than the stars. The Hebrew slaves waited for rescue, and you sent Miriam and Moses to enact your liberation. Israel waited in exile for renewal, and you empowered prophets and poets with your life-giving speech. As the whole world groaned in waiting for release and rebirth, you sent Jesus, born of strong Mary, fathered by humble Joseph, incarnate in our humility, in solidarity with the suffering and the poor, 
full of wisdom and grace for all. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Hoping beyond hope, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering all your promises fulfilled in Jesus' body given for the beloved universe, in the great hope of the resurrection, and in all that is to come by your mercy, with eager expectation we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Send your spirit into this broken world, into our hopeful, imperfect gathering, and on this sacred bread and wine, so that we may be healed and made whole again, and filled with the courage to love. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and thanks to you, Holy God, through Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, here and now, and into the great beyond. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal with us today, then receive this blessing. May the God of all hope and peace grant you strength and guidance to live lives of holiness and godliness as we await for the coming day of the Lord. Amen. If you are receiving the meal today, then hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and abundant God, you have done great things for us, and we rejoice. In this bread and cup you give us life forever. In your boundless mercy, strengthen us and open our hearts to the world's needs for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. 
the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. A few announcements before we conclude. First of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to everybody who uh, shared Advent wreaths, uh, photos, and videos today. It's really fun to see the, fr the faces of friends and the many holy spaces in which we're gathering these days. You can participate too uh, by sharing your pictures on Facebook on our Facebook page or by emailing them to Cindy in the church office. We still have Advent wreath and Jesse tree packets available outside the front door of the church building for pickup. And if you'd like to check out a hymnal for home use during the pandemic, uh, just call or email the church office and we'll schedule a time when you can come by and we can check that out to you. We're also able to uh, make arrangements to have someone drop any of those things off at your house if you're not able or comfortable uh, picking them up yourself. Um, a big uh, Speaking of Advent calendars, our friends at St. Christopher's Community Church in Olympia are, are offering daily Advent devotions by text, and they've invited us to participate. You can text Advent Cal to the number 360-810-3292. That's 360-810-3292. And you'll receive a daily text with a link to a devotion. That info is also on our Facebook page. Another fun uh, Advent calendar project um, is our reverse Advent calendar. On a normal Advent calendar, you open up a door each day and take something out, but in a reverse Advent calendar, each day you put something in. So this year we're doing a reverse Advent calendar to give to food backpacks for kids. Each day uh, there's another food item that you can add to your calendar, uh, and at the end of the month uh, we will bring all those uh, boxes of food to the church and uh, give them to the local food backpacks program to distribute as part of their uh, program. So you can find a list of items and more information on that in our church newsletter. Um, also, speaking of food backpacks for kids, a big thank you to all of our knitters and crocheters out there who've been working tirelessly through the month of November to create hats. You created 128 hats to go to the Food Backpacks for Kids program. Those hats were taken to the collection center on the week of Thanksgiving, which means that this week there are 128 kids out there with warm heads and warm hearts, knowing that somebody loves them enough to spend that much time to make them a hat just for them. So thank you for that. Finally, um, each year at Christmas, members of our congregation really enjoy honoring or remembering loved ones with ELCA good gifts. It's customary at Christmas to give gifts, but instead of giving another tchotchke that somebody won't use or a toy that won't last, good gifts make a real difference in people's lives. There are things like books for school children, or money to build a well, or a farm animal to support a family. If you'd like to give ELCA good gifts in honor or in memory of a loved one this year, you can do so directly through their website. That's elca.org slash goodgifts. Then let Cindy know the, per the name of the person that you're honoring and the amount that you donated by December 18th, if you'd like that to be listed in our Christmas worship bulletin. Once again, thank you for being a part of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can gather right here with Anu's Day for worship every Sunday morning at 9.45 a.m. And, at, and every weekday evening at 7 p.m. we will gather on Zoom for a short Advent devotional using Father Richard Rohr's book, Preparing for Christmas. The link to that Zoom meeting as well as the uh, links and information for lots of other things happening at Anu's Day can be found on our website under the Events tab. That's anusdaylutheran.org. And now go in peace. Christ is with you. Amen. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a phone call or a text or an email or by sending them the link to this video so they can worship with you. God bless you in your week.